Hey y'all, how's it going? Got a short podcast, two stories. I think it's going to be about 20 minutes long. I'm kind of busy with Steve Lilly and some other things, but I wanted to get a couple of stories out today. Hope you all enjoy it. Let's get into the podcast. All right, here we go. This is an email from a woman. Uh, This story, I think it starts in Illinois and winds up in Florida. Let's read on and see. My grandmother lived in a farmhouse deep in the woods of southern Illinois. As a kid, I remember going with my brother and my parents and staying the weekend. My grandmother was an amazing cook. She would fix a dinner of meatloaf and chicken and dumplings and mashed potatoes and corn and green beans, stuffing and rolls and several cakes and pies and sweet tea, and then she would apologize for not making more. I love going to my grandmother's house. She had a large willow tree on her property, and all of my cousins and my brother and I would play for hours under that tree. I was never afraid at Grandma's house, but all that changed one day in 1969 when I was eight years old. I remember it like it was yesterday. It's etched in my mind forever. All of us kids were playing outside under the willow tree when Grandma called us in for dinner. Well, I ignored her and continued to play and have a great time. I didn't notice that I was all alone. My cousins and my brother had already gone inside. Well, something wasn't right. The atmosphere had changed. It changed so much that as an eight-year-old little girl, I noticed it. I felt I was in danger, and I've only felt this feeling one other time in my 60 years of living, and I'll tell you about that at the end of this email. It felt like a cold chill came over me, and I had the feeling that I was not alone, but I was alone. I looked around the wood line, and there it was. There standing beside a tree was a large ape. He was black and standing completely still, but staring right at me. I was terrified, and I ran as fast as I could into the house while hysterically crying. And My mother and father and my grandparents all ran to me and asked me what was the matter. I told them what I saw. My mother and my grandmother assured me that it was okay and I calmed down. My cousins continued to eat dinner, but the adults began to quietly discuss what I had seen. And Then I heard my grandmother say, he's back. My grandfather started saying words that I can't share on this family-friendly forum, and he grabbed his rifle and went out the door followed by my father. I was so scared and my mother acted just as scared as I was. As my grandmother cleared the dishes, I asked her what it was that I saw. My grandmother told me that she didn't know what it was, but we needed to keep a secret from the rest of the kids. So I agreed to keep the secret. My grandfather and my dad later came back inside and they put their rifles away. They sat down for a late dinner and discussed everything quietly. I never could get my parents to talk with me about what I saw that night. I believe what I saw was a Sasquatch, and I believe my grandparents were aware of him on their property. Shortly after this, they sold the farmhouse and the property, and they moved to the city. I'm now 60 years old, and I have never forgotten this encounter, and I never discuss it with anyone. Oh, and that eerie feeling that I felt right before I saw the Sasquatch? My husband and I were driving through Ocala National Forest a few years ago. We were enjoying the pretty trees and talking when all of a sudden that same feeling of danger and that cold chill came all over me. I was shaken up and I finally told my husband what I was feeling. Was there a Sasquatch in that forest as we drove by? I'll never know for sure, and I don't understand that feeling that came over me. I've heard other people describe this same feeling, and I hope I never have it again. 
And that's the end of her email. And I think that feeling is probably called a panic attack or or something like it. Now, I'm not a psychologist or a, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know a lot about that stuff. But it sounds like a panic attack. And if you're not prone to those and you just get those, you've only had two in your life. It might be safe to say there was a Bigfoot in the forest as you guys drove through Alcala. But that's a real good story. I, there's something about these stories about these kids, the adults remembering things back when they were kids that they've forgotten. And I've talked about this a hundred times. But something about these stories jogs people's memories and they remember strange things they've stored away in their mind for years and all of a sudden they remember a strange thing and they put two and two together and they come to the conclusion that maybe it was a Bigfoot. Maybe. Maybe. Who knows? I don't know. I, I, I don't know anything. This was a real good story and the woman's a good writer and I really appreciate it. So thank you, ma'am. This person didn't say whether to use their name or not, but it's a good story. It's a real good story, and I think you guys are going to enjoy it. He writes, Joining the Marine Corps was a rite of passage for me. My grandfather served in the Army during the Korean War. My father and uncle were both in the Marine Corps during the Vietnam War. I was a Marine in Afghanistan, stationed at Camp Leatherneck. My MOS was an 0311. I was an infantry rifleman. I've seen things that I wish I hadn't, but I did it on behalf of my country and for those I love. In turn, I learned to respect my brothers in arms and we developed an unbreakable bond. It's something no one who hasn't been in the military will ever truly understand. During my first tour in Afghanistan, I was told a story that I brushed off as hogwash at the time. Storytelling was a way of passing time for us. Some of the stories that were passed around were great, some were funny, and others were fantastical. My gunny was telling me this one, so good, bad, or otherwise, I sat and listened. He said there was a patrol up in the mountains that came across a cave system. As they approached the mouth of the system, large boulders came crashing down on them. It wasn't like a landslide or an avalanche. It was as if rocks were being thrown down on them. Many of the stones crashed into the men, wounding and killing others. Those who survived claimed that they saw an 11-foot-tall monster tossing the stones. My gunny said that these men described the creature as being all muscle and covered with hair that looked like ropes hanging off its body. One of the Marines managed to throw himself out of the way as this massive creature rushed down the mountainside toward them. And in doing so, he effectively threw himself off the mountain. He tumbled down the rocky incline, sliding and spinning and bashing himself against the hard terrain until he finally came to a stop at the bottom. He was barely conscious but alive, and both of his legs were broken. From his position below, he looked up and he saw his brothers being ripped apart by the beast. The sound of the bullets zipping by, cracking against the rocks and slamming into the body of the monster, mingled with the screams of terror and agony. He watched in fascinated horror until his own pain overtook him and he faded into oblivion. When he came to, he was at FOB Geronimo where he conveyed his story to my gunny. I listened as gunny told the story, but I dismissed it as a bunch of crap. Big hairy monsters on a mountain? Yeah, right. Gunny must have heard me chuckle under my breath, or maybe he saw a look of disbelief on my face. He leaned in and he said, Kid, there's a lot in this world you can't even imagine. Most of the time, you don't have to worry about it because you're not the one taking the crap. But someday it's going to be thrown at you and you're going to be the one who has to clean it up. My gunny was a warrior. I completed my four years of service and returned home to take up my life as a civilian. I brought with me a bad case of PTSD. For the first eight months that I was stateside, I slept on the hardwood floors at my parents' house. 
and I finally realized that I had to do something about it to get away and clear my head. I had to find myself again. My uncle owned a small two-bedroom cabin in the Sierra Nevadas. I called him and I asked if it would be okay if I went up there to stay for a couple of weeks, maybe do some fishing, or if I could get tags, do a little hunting. He said I could on the grounds that I'd do a few minor repairs while I was there. Well, that seemed like a fair trade-off to me, as long as I could bring along a childhood friend. My uncle said that was fine. I called Ben, and I told him my plan. He was a bigger outdoorsman than I was. He grew up hunting, trapping, and fishing, and doing pretty much everything outdoors. He was a 68 whiskey in the army, which was a medic. Ironically, he was medically discharged. We arrived at the cabin, towing a 10-week supply of booze and three weeks' worth of steak and chicken. For the first three days, we fished for the better part of the day, and then at night, we'd kick back and drink heavily and reminisce about the good old days growing up. In between those stories, we shared war stories. It was a typical case of the first liar never wins. It wasn't until late in the evening on day four that things took a strange turn. We were sitting out on the porch and relaxing, having a drink, when rocks the size of acorns started landing on the porch at our feet. Four or five of them bounced off the wooden planks as I jumped up and looked out into the darkness. My first thought was who or what would be throwing rocks at us? We were out in the middle of nowhere. Ben was suspicious, but he quickly reasoned that it was rocks falling off the roof of the cabin. Well, I disagreed. There was no way those rocks were rolling off the roof. My sidearm had a light on it, so I pulled it out and I scanned the dark underbrush surrounding us. After several minutes, and I didn't see anything. No more rocks were thrown at us, and I was getting tired. I cracked open another beer, and I turned in. The next day was uneventful. We caught some brown and cutthroat trout on the fly. That was about it. On day five, we decided to do some hiking up on a mountain to see a view. We each brought a can of bear spray and our sidearms and our camel packs with us. I'm glad we did. Not 45 minutes into the hike, we came across two black bears. They weren't hostile. If anything, they seemed nervous and anxious and we shouted at them and raised a ruckus, and they ran off into the woods. By the time we reached the top of the mountain, our cabin was nowhere in sight, and we took a look around and bet each other that the first one to see a buck would win 50 bucks. We sat up there for a good three hours with our binoculars looking out across the magnificent scenery and taking in the beauty of the area. I was facing off in one direction, and Ben was a little ways over and facing the opposite way. Hey, I suddenly heard him call in a hushed whisper. Come over here and take a look at this. He was pointing at something as I moved over to his position, but I didn't see anything. Look under the juniper tree, he said as I raised my field glasses. I saw it immediately. Under that tree, almost inside of it, was what looked like a black bear standing on two legs. But this thing was huge. I'd barely got eyes on it when it moved off into the brush away from us, and then it was gone. The thing never dropped down on all fours. It stayed on two legs the whole time. What the hell was that? I asked, unwilling to believe my own eyes. When Ben didn't respond, I looked over at him. He was staring in sort of a daze, as though he was lost in his own thoughts. Ben, I said firmly. Well, that brought him out of it. I don't know what it was, he managed. And then he added, I think I'm in shock. And there was a moment's pause before he said, it was headed toward the cabin. The implications hit my stomach like a lead bullet but we were a pair of 20-something ex-vets and neither one of us was going to show fear. We took off toward the cabin, hoping to head it off before it got there and did any damage. 
We reached the cabin without running across the strange walking bear. As we stood in front of it looking for any signs of destruction, our backs were to the woods. Behind us, something grunted. It sounded almost like a monkey laughing. I spun around to face the unknown animal, but nothing appeared to be there. Tensions rose as we heard something crashing through the woods like a dinosaur in Jurassic Park. Whatever was out there, it was coming at us. The setting sun had turned the sky an angry red and was casting long shadows across our field of vision. I experienced the same feeling I had in Afghanistan when a battle was about to begin, except that this felt like a different kind of battle. Ben and I sprang into action, stringing up empty beer cans on a fishing line around the perimeter of the cabin. I unloaded the buckshot from our 12-gauge shells and set them up to go off if they were tripped. They would take a big boom, but without the projectiles. We wanted to make sure nothing crossed our space without us knowing about it. And as extreme as it sounds, we had mentally slipped into combat mode. It was a long and restless night. We sat mostly in silence inside the cabin, listening to every sound, our bodies on edge and our minds racing. At 3 a.m., the cans clank wildly as something grunted and growled as if frantically trying to get untangled, and we jumped up and grabbed our flashlights and readied our weapons before flying through the door with me on point and Ben taking up the rear. We turned the light toward the woods and hit pay dirt. It was like something right out of a nightmare. A nine-foot-tall, black, hairy monster stood at the perimeter, its chest cavity expanding and contracting as it breathed in and out in frustration. It was grabbing at the twisted fishing line and pulling at it and yanking out some of its own hair in the process. Saliva dripped from its enraged face. I lined up my shot and I fired into its left quad. Ben shot three rounds at it. The creature released a blood-curdling roar that vibrated through our chest like a sonic wave and took off through the brush, destroying everything in its path. We were at war again. Was it my fault? Did I start something that needn't have been started? Mentally, I beat myself up over not having better trigger discipline. We spent the rest of the night waiting for the sun to rise. It was a tense wait. The next morning, Ben acted as if nothing had happened, and I wondered if he had forgotten. Then I began to question it myself. Did that really happen? I went outside to inspect the spot where we had seen the monster. A dried blood trail led into the woods through the path of destruction. It did happen. It wasn't all in my head. It wasn't a bad dream. And I went back inside. I know, I know, Ben said as I walked in. No way we're leaving here without answers. And I nodded in agreement. I started the morning coffee before oiling up my AR-10. As I was changing out the birdcage, I stared off into the brush. Somewhere out there, I could feel the monster staring back at me. The rest of this story is gory and gruesome. I want to stay peaceful for your listeners, so I'm choosing to end it here. If you want the rest, let me know. If not, I think you can imagine what happened from that point forward. Uh, no, we don't know what happens, and I think if I'd have known this story ended like this, I may have skipped it. If you, if you have the rest of this story, it's easy for you to write, I'm talking to the writer. You better send it to me, man. This is really good. I don't know if this is fiction or real, but it's a a really good story. I I don't really know what to say about it. Just send me the rest of it. I want to know, did you kill a Sasquatch? Let me know if it's it's real or if you made this story up. Either way, it's a good story. If you made it up, you got a great imagination. If you didn't didn't make it up... uh, the. Uh, the audience will want to know let's put it that way thanks for sending it though 
Okay, I think that's going to wind this podcast up. I've got a lot going on with Steve Lilly. My regular job, Christmas is coming up, and I want to do some deer hunting. Matter of fact, as soon as I hit this stop record button, I'm going out to my deer stand, and I'm going to sit out there till dark. It's about 2.30 right now. It gives me about two hours left of daylight. All I got to do is walk out the back, so that's where I'm heading. Hope you guys have uh, uh, have enjoyed this podcast, and we'll see you guys on the next one. Thanks. Thanks.